That's me, brother. Thank you. I'm going to talk about something that might surprise a lot of you, which is um, I, what I'm going to talk about tonight. It's the most exciting time in everybody in here's entire life when you understand what is happening in this country with religious freedom. So you hear a lot of bad news, get ready for some good news because God is at work. Um, so <laughs> let, me, let me start with the basics. The basics, uh, what is First Liberty? First Liberty is the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom. So if you're a fifth grade boy by the name of Giovanni Rubio and you're told you can bring any book you want to free reading time at school and then you bring your favorite book, your Bible, and you're told you can't have religious books at school, and you're a poor family, and you live outside of Miami-Dade, what do you do? I mean, you get $100,000 out of the bank and go hire a team of attorneys. Uh, that's why we exist. We came in so that we could represent Giovanni and his family so that when we won the case, which we did, we don't just win for Giovanni and his family, but we set a precedent that protects all of our children and our grandchildren. And that's the best quick summary I can give you for what First Liberty does. How did I get involved in this? Back, back when I was in high school, I knew my gifts were in analytical thinking and speaking. And I thought, well, I either need to be a pastor or a lawyer. And people said, that's like a God or Satan uh, choice, isn't it, between a pastor and a lawyer? And I analyzed my, G and, uh, my DNA, and I, and I looked, and I thought, you know, I'd probably do better at dispensing justice rather than mercy, so I'd probably make a better lawyer than a pastor. And I went to law school and uh, got out, clerked for a federal judge. When you do that, you sort of research, write opinions, you do that for one year. And then you get, uh, because you've had a unique perspective, all the big law firms would give you really nice offers to come work for their law firm because you understand what it's like to be on the other side of the bench. You know what it's like to, to you know, not to watch people that are arguing so, so strongly that they're losing their credibility, that are filing things they shouldn't file, that all this... And so I had all these nice offers, and I sat in my little clerk's office, and I thought, Lord, I just feel like I'd suffocate if I went and did a regular law job. And uh, I remember thinking, well, what do, what do you want to do? And I thought, well, I want to use my legal skills because I feel like you've shown me I should do that, but I want to help pastors and churches and religious freedoms and our founding principles, and I'd even like to go to seminary part-time if I could. And I laughed because there was no job, paying job to do any such thing. And about two weeks later, two lawyers from major law firms, I'd never met these guys, called me out of the blue. They said, will you go to lunch? And I said, sure. And they said, look, we started donating our time for religious freedom. We're getting so many calls now, it's hurting our ability to make a living. But we heard about you and we were wondering, would you be willing to come on, do legal cases, help pastors, churches, religious freedoms, and our founding principles? And you can even go to seminary part-time if you want to. <laughs> Now, being in my mid-20s, maybe a little immature in my faith, I said, let me pray about it, like that wasn't an answer to prayer. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, I said yes, and uh, they said, how much you need to live on? And I was making 28000 as a, a clerk for a federal court, and these guys started pitching in out of their pocket. And that was um, 30, almost exactly 30 years ago. And 30 years later, First Liberty is now the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom. So I, I had no idea where this country was going, but God did, you know. And a lot of times we encourage our kids, don't go into that area. That's dark. That's a dark area. That's a tough area. That's exactly where we need to take the light. And so... I guarantee you there are a lot of kids out there right now that are trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, and there's about to be a job created for them that doesn't even exist now because God has a mission for them in this country. And, uh, and my, my example is one of millions of believers across our country, uh, people who have given up on our country. Uh, they don't know God. Uh, you know, there's no reason to give up because we've had a lot of revivals in this country. And uh, the truth is always more powerful than the darkness. Uh, so, so I think great things are ahead. Uh, but I, I want to start with some basics because everybody in here, because of what Lamb and Line Ministry is, you automatically know why religious freedom. Yes, religious freedom is very important. I, it's something I really do care about because it's the only hope for people to hear the truth. But I want to go a little deeper about what if you're not even a person of faith? Should you care about this? And so let's start with a video by a guy who doesn't even know the Lord. Hey, 
If somebody uh, told us that we were going to be crawling through barbed wire fences and escaping and moving across the ocean to America, everybody would have said, that's absolutely silly. That'll never happen. If they caught, let's say, a politician who opposed them, they put him on trial, but the evidence might have been presented, but you know the outcome was a foregone conclusion. So they had total control of you. That's how the dictatorship is run. My father was, first of all, uh, very patriotic, had uh, strong beliefs in democracy. The people that he helped were, if not friends, very good acquaintances. He knew they were going to get killed. So when he got arrested, my mother got arrested and my brother, who was eight years older, got arrested. So my whole family, except me, were in jail. Uh, then my father would, would have been executed, but my mother managed to bribe the judge. He got sent to concentration camp in lieu of that, where he was you know, beaten, uh, not fed, I mean, basically tortured. As soon as he escaped, his name was on the radio all the time, and he was one of the most wanted people. There was a, a secret service sitting in our front hallway all the time. As you study history, one needs to be vigilant all the time because you cannot take anything for granted. When uh, you start losing freedoms, it is more than likely that it'll keep on chipping away. The opportunities we have, the ability to express yourself and do whatever you want to do and be able to achieve uh, things without being blocked are unparalleled. The political correctness is, is, is ridiculous. I mean, it, it is going too far. Defending the ability to have crosses or Christmas decorations just is getting to a point of absurdity. When I think about uh, what was happening in Czechoslovakia at that time, there are parallels because I think Anytime you start taking away people's freedom, it just goes on. And you must take guard in the early stages as opposed to wait and let it all collapse when it's too late. Nobody expected communism in Czechoslovakia when it happened. It happened. This is, I think, a great reminder, a great picture of what happens when Christians aren't involved in their country. And so this is one of the things I love about uh, Lamb and Lion and David Reagan is that everybody's not just talking about the Bible, they're actually talking about applying the Bible in our society. Uh, because if you don't, incredible evil will occur. And our founders called this our first freedom because they understood if you lose religious freedom, you'll lose all your freedoms your political freedoms. This guy in this video came up to me after a talk and he said, look, I, I'm not a person of faith like you are. He said, but I think that what you guys are doing is the most important thing anybody's doing in this country because I saw this happen in my country. They took down the religious symbols and two months later, we all lost our political freedoms. And he handed me a check for $5,000 and he said, I'm gonna be supporting you from now on. And he doesn't even know Jesus but he understands what happens to freedom when you lose religious freedom. So this being such a core, our founders calling it our first freedom, how are we doing? Well, seven years ago, we had 47 cases. Last year, we had 447. I mean, what's happening across the country, you see it, is more hostile than probably we've ever seen. Uh, I obviously can't go through all those cases. I thought I'd just give you a few examples of some of the areas that are troublesome to me. Um, that need to be highlighted. One would be the new set of, of cases we're having to do to protect people in senior living facilities. Um, I mean, 
Uh, this picture says it all. We got a picture of Donna Dunbar, what they put on, in her uh, senior center on the piano. I mean, they, they refused to allow these seniors to have a Bible study. They put a, you know, all Christian music. People think the attorneys did the sign, right? Because it's such a great piece of evidence. Um, no, this is what they did. You know, you can't, religious discrimination in housing is against the law. But this is what they did to Don. Now you think, well, that's outrageous. I can't imagine anything more outrageous. Well, you haven't met Ken Hauge. Ken Hauge is a minister, 80 years old, and a uh, retired minister. And he is living in one of these facilities. And people in these facilities, a lot of people can't leave. They, you know, they're not in a health or other situations where they can go out to a church or whatever. So a number of people came to Ken and they said, will you do a Bible study maybe once a week? And he said, sure, there's a common area room that any of us can use. I'm happy to put in to use that, and I'll be happy to do that. Well, they said, well, no, you can use it, but not if you're going to do something religious like have a Bible study. And Ken was kind of shocked, uh, but he said, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just hold it in my apartment. They have now sent him a letter telling him he will be evicted if he holds a Bible study in his apartment. And, uh, and so this is happening all across the country. And I, I think this is particularly, um, well, egregious. It's just horrible because you're robbing people of the ability to ever have any sort of religious meeting or service or study the rest of their lives. Many of these people can't go. And this is, some, I bet everybody in here knows somebody who's in one of these facilities right now. Uh, whether your family member, your friend, we're all probably, most of us are going to be in one of these facilities someday. We've got to win this battle because this, this cannot be allowed to stand. Uh, we're in federal court on, beca- on behalf of Ken Hauge, and we're hoping to set some precedent that'll really affect the whole country. But that's just an example of the attacks. The, the second thing I'll tell you about is the attacks against uh, Jewish synagogues. We have, we have Jewish synagogues we're representing in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in New York, I mean, all across the country. And, uh, I mean, you think in New York, for instance, um, they've told them, that if you use a certain percentage, this is Aramont, New York, of your home for a religious meeting, then you violate the ordinance, like 20%. And you have to count the common areas. They're literally measuring the bookcases that have religious books in their home as a way to keep the Orthodox Jews in that community from having meetings. Um, again, in Dallas, uh, we've got a Jewish synagogue. If you, if you really hate Jews and you want to get rid of Jews, one of the things you can do with Orthodox Jews is close their synagogue because they have to walk to the synagogue. And so if you, they can't have the synagogue, they have to move. So what they've done in this case, they, our clients met every health and safety code regulation, but the city still came after them. Why? Because they didn't have enough parking spaces. Okay, they're Orthodox Jews... They walk on the Sabbath, but this is why they were closing down. And again, I want you to see the picture of what they did to the rabbi's car. This is not in Germany or some other country. This is in the United States of America that we're having to defend these attacks. So it's across the country, and it's different things than we used to think of. We never used to have to think of attacks in your business because of your faith, right? Everybody's seen the crazy situation that we're fighting with the Chick-fil-A situation down in San Antonio, I think. I mean, the idea that the government is coming after a business, not because of anything the business has ever done, but because they found out that the Christian owners of the business have a private foundation that gave to a radical group like the Salvation Army and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I mean, if the government can now destroy your business and not allow you to do business because they find the owners are Christian or giving to Christian causes, I mean, we've lost religious freedom as a country. And so you've all heard about Aaron and Melissa Klein, I think, uh, two of our clients, uh, Sweet Cakes. This is a, a family, a, a precious family. Uh, I mean, they, they started this business. They worked from nothing. They finally got a place they have five beautiful children, and they had these two women come in, and they said, we want to buy baked goods from you, and this is a, a gay couple. They served them, loved them, had no problem with that. Then they said, we want you to do a custom wedding cake. And they said, well, because of our biblical beliefs, we can't, 
We can't celebrate things. We wouldn't do a divorce cake. We wouldn't do all kinds of things. But let us find you something where somebody will do a great job for you. And they did that. And well, the next thing they knew, um, the government was coming after them, state of Oregon. They were fined $135,000. Uh, their business has now been bankrupted. And they were ordered by the judge not to speak publicly their beliefs about marriage because it might cause mental anguish to the couple. So I, I just want to show you a video because sometimes we don't realize how real these people are and what they're going through. So I, I wanted you to see Aaron and Melissa Klein. I've always been very artistic. It's definitely my passion. I put all myself, my heart, and my soul into them. And then I step back and it's it's this beautiful work of art, and again, you get to eat it. You know? So we dedicated our bakery before we opened our shop because we wanted everything that we did in our shop to be done to glorify the Lord, to put a smile on God's face. It was definitely a really good, booming business. It was a normal day at the shop. She came in with her mom. I asked for the name of the bride and groom. She informed me this time the cake was for her and it was two brides. Um, I was apologetic. I informed her, I'm really sorry, we don't do cakes for same-sex weddings. We served these two women in the past. We had a great time. When I do a cake, I, I feel a part of what these people are celebrating. For me to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding would fully go against what I believe. About two weeks afterward, I got a letter in the mail from the um, Oregon State Department of Justice or Attorney General's office. We had to pay them $135,000. Nothing was off limits. Our vehicles, our house, everything was on the table for this judgment. Soon after that, we saw some of the worst things you can imagine. We have five beautiful children. We had people saying, I hope your kids get sick and die. I mean, we lost our business. I always just thought that you know, it was going to be a family business that we would get to just have that for the rest of our lives. And you work so hard to build something up and something that you poured your heart into and was your passion. And to lose that has just been devastating for me, all because we couldn't participate in an event we had to lose our business over. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. The government here is violating the Klein's constitutional rights, their rights to free speech, the free exercise of their religion, and their religious liberty. All Aaron and Melissa Klein want is the right to be able to run their business consistent with their faith. Instead, the government has destroyed their business in going after them personally. We stood up for our faith. I mean, that's to me, that's like what, what's saying that was what we did wrong, is that we stood for what we believe. I do not regret it at all. God has drastically changed my life. And I am somebody today that is so different from who I was before. And the way I feel like with our business is that like, I would give my business up in a second for him because of what he's done for me. This time they went after the clients. If they can take their rights away, what's to keep them from taking your rights away? If the government can tell the clients that they can't live out their beliefs, they can come after any of our beliefs on anything. Aaron and Melissa have been through just an incredible um, five or six years. Uh, death threats on their children. Um, you know, he's having to been d doing side jobs, anything to kind of keep bread on the table. Uh, and, of course, it was not only a bad decision below, but by the Oregon Court of Appeals. It's a very liberal state, obviously. Um, the good news is three weeks ago, we got a victory at the United States Supreme Court. They reversed the decision from Oregon. And... <clears throat> and sent it back down and said, you need to reevaluate your decision in light of the masterpiece decision, which is about not being hostile to religion. And they said, we're going to give you one more shot. I'm pretty confident at this point that we're going to win this case. 
um, and that this issue is going to be won nationally because of who's on the court now and, and how they see the Constitution and religious freedom. But uh, the good news is we vacated this horrible decision. Uh, the, it's not bad news, but the truth is now we've got some work to do. It's going to take us a couple of more years, but I'm really confident that at the end we're going to have a victory. And it, it's not just going to be a victory for the clients. It's going to be a victory for every person of faith uh, who is involved in business in this country. The last just quick clip area I'll give you is the military. Um, you know, six or so years ago, I don't think we didn't even have a, mil a division. We, we didn't feel like there was this great need to defend religious freedom in the military, but wow, did that change. We were having to defend chaplains, all kinds of attacks that we never imagined would be occurring within our military against those who were serving us. The idea that these people who are making these sacrifices would have their religious freedom stripped from them when that's the very thing that they rely upon uh, is, is outrageous. And, uh, but we're having to. And uh, many of you have probably heard about the Oscar Rodriguez case. Uh, Oscar is a 33-year veteran. And if you've seen the flag folding ceremonies that occur at a lot of uh, places, private retirements, et cetera, it's where they slowly unfold the flag and then they slowly fold it back. Uh, Oscar has a speech that goes with that that's a very powerful speech. Uh, and it ends by saying, God bless our flag, God bless our troops, God bless America. And a guy asked uh, Oscar, he said, Oscar, would, would you be willing to do that at my uh, retirement ceremony? And he said, I'd be honored to. And so at this uh, Chuck Roberson's re retirement ceremony, Oscar, unbeknownst to Oscar, the colonel who leads that base, decided he didn't want anybody mentioning God on this base, even in their own private retirement ceremony. So as Oscar gets up, and you can look at this online sometime, you go to our website or whatever, there are video cameras going in somebody's retirement ceremony, so that's the good news for us. We captured all this on video. As Oscar gets up, as the flag is being unfolded, uniformed military grab him and throw him out of the room because he's going to mention God, something I never thought I would see in my life. And uh, now the, the, uh, uh, the good news is uh, policy has been changed now to where supposedly this won't happen again, um, and it's the written policy has been changed. But uh, bad news is they're still in court arguing that uh, you shouldn't be able to bring a lawsuit if they do this to somebody because uh, there's nowhere for anybody to go uh, court-wise uh, when they violate the First Amendment in our military. Uh, so they're still defending what they did, although they are changing the policy, realizing they're in big trouble uh, because of what they did to Oscar. The newest case we have in the military is the POW MIA table. Many of you probably have seen one of these. I think we got a picture of the of the one in our case. Um, it's, a, it's a round table with a, uh, like a flower and a place setting and a Bible. It's to represent that we're waiting for them to come back. And uh, this table was put up by a, a local POW MIA group in the local uh, VA building. And uh, a lawsuit has been filed saying that they must remove the Bible from the table. Okay, that's not just the Bible in that picture. That Bible was given to the VA group by a 95-year-old veteran who's still alive today who spent nine months in a German prisoner of war camp, and that's the Bible that got him through it. And the idea that we would have to ban Bibles from POW MIA table is just outrageous. But these are the kind of things that we're having to fight that we didn't used to. And I'll tell you, at first, the VA told them to remove the Bible. But we spent some time with them, and this was before the lawsuit was filed, and they got up to speed on the law. They realized there's nothing wrong with the Bible on the table, and they stood their ground, and now a lawsuit has been filed, and we are defending the VA group who put the display up, and our VA, the federal government, is standing up against these guys as well. So we're standing up together to fight against what they're trying to do. <laughs> now, some of you are like, you know, I came to the Lamb and Lion Conference, and I, there's a depressing speaker on Friday night was talking about all these bad things. So let me tell you the good news. The good news is we have a method of dealing with these attacks, and it's not a theory. We've been doing it for a long time, and it's working. And really what it is, it's the body of Christ. 
And that is if you were to look at legal groups that are out there, I don't care whether whether they're left wing or right wing or what their issue is, they have the same model. Raise as much money as you can raise. Use that money to hire as many attorneys as you can. Put those attorneys in an office in D.C. or New York or L.A. and fly them around and cover as many of your cases as you can cover. That's not our model. Our model is there's all these people of faith who went to law school because they wanted to to make a difference. They wanted to stand for what was right. 30 years later, these are the, the best litigators at the best law firms in our country. And they've done honorable work for their clients, but they've never gotten to do a case for the kingdom. And so we go and we sit down with them and we say, look, you're one of the best of the best. If we give you everything you need, are you willing to give your time on one of these cases? They're like, sign me up. I've been waiting 35 years. We know it's going to happen when we give them that first case. For the first time in their life, all their talent, all their gifts, all their training, everything they've learned their whole life is lined up with their faith. They've never felt that before. It's kind of unfair, but we now know we have them for the rest of their lives as one of our network attorneys. And they're the big attorneys. They give cover to the younger attorneys. They get to taste what it's like. They get permission to work. So if you were to go down the top 100 law firms in the United States, you'd find that the vast majority of those don't just donate their time. There are times they literally fight each other over who gets to donate their time on the case. The result of this is twofold. Number one, and this was my original plan, I thought, you know, we could get a lot more done if we had some of these, these people who are in the body giving them their time and their talents. And uh, sure enough, average case we, we spend, for every 10000 we spend, we get 60000 donated. We're literally, it's like God's multiplying the fish and the loaves. It's a six-to-one multiplication of God's resources with God's people. Uh, so it's incredible what we can accomplish through the body of Christ. <laughs> what I did not count on was the win-loss ratio. If you watch nonprofit groups, they're fighting big monsters, the government, everything else. They maybe win 30% of their cases if they're good. Um, Our win right now for 18 years in a row has been above 90% every year, every year. And that's because of the body of Christ. I mean, if, uh, if we have a case in, you know, Montana, our attorney lives in Montana. He's from the biggest law firm in Montana. He's one of the best lawyers in Montana. And when he walks into court and looks at the judge, they grew up in elementary school together. They lost a tooth together in first grade. And then the ACLU guy flies in from New York City or Los Angeles. Well, you know what? He's playing an away game. He doesn't know the jury. He doesn't know the community. And so if you look at how major corporations do their work, I mean, it's exactly our model. I mean, if you're a Ford Motor Company in Detroit, Michigan, Do you send your Detroit attorneys to Texas to defend you in a lawsuit? No, you do not. You get a Texas law firm to go in that court who knows the practice, who knows the jury, who knows the community. Yet we're the only group in the country that's doing it this way. And we could never do it if if it wasn't for the fact that we have attorneys everywhere in this country, believers who have waited their whole life to finally give their extreme talent for the kingdom. And it's not only good for us, it blesses them. They're like, I'm ready to quit and go do something for the kingdom. They finally get to use incredible talent that they have for the kingdom. And then it blesses the client because they get attorneys. They can, I mean, there are teams of attorneys all charge $1,000 uh, you know, an hour, maybe. And there might be six or seven attorneys on the case. There's no way you would pay for that. But they're like, you've got to let me work on this case. You've got to. And so you get incredible talent, working for the client, working for them in their own lives, and then think of how that blesses everybody in the body. Because when those precedents come down and they're 90% wins, those precedents bless everybody across the country. So it's exactly how God's, you know, system is supposed to work. People with great talents are supposed to exercise those and put those into play in a way that blesses everybody else. And that's exactly what's happening in these cases. So that's the good news. But let me tell you the even greater news. The greater news is I would say, six months ago, I would have said we have an opportunity to begin to change history in this area of religious freedom. I've been doing this for 30 years. But now I won't say that. We are changing history right now. It has started. Um stuff that I never thought possible in my lifetime are, are happening. 
Um, what am I talking about? Well, let me lay some of these out. Why is this happening? Why is there this new hope and, and we're watching history change? Let's start with Judges. Uh, when uh, the election occurred between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, we were preparing for how to advance religious freedom under a Hillary Clinton presidency because our job is to advance religious freedom. And then this Trump guy won, and we were like, okay, we got to reevaluate. What can we do to advance religious freedom? And we immediately saw tons of opportunities, but the greatest of which was there were 140 judicial seats open waiting to be filled. These were lifetime appointments. And we thought, you know, if you want to affect the future of religious freedom, you put judges on there who are going to follow the Constitution and protect religious freedom, that's a generational shift and protection. And so we, you know, I, I said, all right. And I went to our board and I said, look, here's the opportunity we have. We've never really worked on judges before. And so we don't have a budget for this. And we, I can't take people and say, stop working on your Supreme Court case to work on vetting judges. And they said, well, what do we need? And I said, about two and a half million dollars for every two years that we do this. And uh, they said, well, let's see if we can raise the money. And I had a couple of people quickly come forward for the first two years and say, I'm going to do a million dollars. You start. I'm going to do a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand. And we got the money. And the first one was Gorsuch. Uh, you know, Gorsuch is, I think, has one of the most incredible a history of religious freedom opinions before he was a Supreme Court justice than anybody I ever remember. He is excellent on religious freedom. And I can't tell you everything about what happened, but I'll tell you that the work we did, the research and the things behind the scenes, uh, and I'll tell you this, he was not the first choice, but he ended up being the first choice. And he's a great choice. And I'm convinced he wouldn't have been there if not for what we did behind the scenes on this. Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh donated time with me 18 years ago as a young attorney on religious freedom cases. Donated his time. If you're a rising star attorney like he is, and you say, hey, I'm going to stop, I'm going to put my career aside now because I want to give my time for religious freedom, that's the type of guy you want on the Supreme Court. Somebody who believes in the First Amendment, who sacrifices, who believes in religious freedom, and he's already shown his, he and Gorsuch both, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We argued a case at the Supreme Court uh, just a few months ago. I can't tell you how awesome it was to look to my left and see Gorsuch and look to my right and see Kavanaugh. They were awesome in that case. Um, but I'm not even really just talking about the Supreme Court. I'm talking about what's happening with judges all the way down. And that's because in the past it's always been, well, I helped you get elected and my brother's an attorney and he'd make a great judge. Okay, well, that's not how it's working this time because candidate Trump said, I'm going to pick judges with a particular philosophy, a philosophy that they're not politicians. They're going to follow the original meaning of the Constitution, and that's what a conservative judge is, not a judge who thinks there's some, you know, brilliant moralist that's going to decide all of our issues for us. Their job is to say what the law is, and it's the legislature's job to pass laws. And so, all of a sudden, we started putting incredible judges on the court. And I, there's no way for me to, a num you know, I talk about our network attorneys all over the country. Guess what? They're all becoming federal judges all over the country, okay? Um, and, uh, and I'll just give you one example. There's a guy who's um, top of his class from law school at the University of Texas, um, went to work for one of the biggest law firms in the country, did great work, then decided, I want to do something a little more significant. So he went to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office, putting away terrorists, won a national award for, the, for his prosecution and conviction of, of terrorists and people who were a danger to this, this country. And then Eric Holder came in as the Attorney General and started pulling him off of that work to work on political type stuff for part of his work. And he's like, that's not why I came here. So he left. Well, where did he go? He came to work at First Liberty. He was our deputy general counsel. And uh, I've got a picture of him being sworn in as a new federal judge for the rest of his life, I think. That's Matthew Kaczmarek. <laughs> President Trump nominated him at age 39 to be a federal judge the rest of his life. He is brilliant. He is a strong believer. 
He would rather gnaw his arm off than ever turn away from the Constitution or his faith. You'll never have to worry about him and a lack of integrity on the court. That picture also is interesting because guess who is swearing him in? That other judge was one of our network attorneys, Judge Jim Ho, who's already setting records for his opinions on religious freedom, Second Amendment. He's just been incredible. So I love seeing that picture because it's showing how what's happening is changing the future of the country. So literally what is happening, oh, and I've got uh, some pictures for you. Let me show you what happened in the first two years under Trump, under President Trump. 85 judges were confirmed, 85 for life. Now that's, they're going to be on the bench 30 years, you know, maybe 40 years. But let me show you what we're in the midst of doing now for the second two years. 160, okay? We, we are doubling the rate. And if this occurs, I mean, I just want you to understand what's happening. In the next year, we are solidifying things for the next 30 years. We're changing the future of our country. We're putting people in here who would be sitting next to you in your pew at church. This is very different, and it's, it's great news for the future of our country. Now, let me tell you the other reasons I say history, that we're really changing history, is there are two religion clauses. There's the Establishment Clause, and there's the Free Exercise Clause. Both clauses have one major opinion that have caused grave damage to religious freedom. Uh, under uh, the Free Exercise Clause, it's a case called the Smith Decision, which really has made it to where you can't even bring a free exercise claim. People tend to, instead, they'll bring a free speech claim and say that the speech was religious and was being, uh, uh, you know, censored or, or infringed. But it's, it's just sad. Well, we have a case, the Coach Kennedy case. I think a lot of people are aware of the Coach Kennedy case. Coach Kennedy was a guy who, um, uh, after the game, he made a pledge to God that he would go by himself to a knee for 15 to 20 seconds and say a silent prayer. When everybody goes to the center field and does their stuff, he said a prayer thanking God for the privilege of coaching those young men. And they said, if you do that again, we're going to fire you. Well, he made a pledge to God, so he did it, and they fired him. And unfortunately for him, he lives in the Ninth Circuit, which Rush Limbaugh calls the Ninth Circus. And uh, most liberal court in the country, it's out of San Francisco. Uh, by the way, the Ninth Circuit, in, it, we are, when we get the judges through, we have in the pipeline right now, that will be two seats away from flipping to a conservative circuit. That's how things are changing. But it's not there yet. So what did they say in the Coach Kennedy case? They said coaches are not allowed to pray in public if anyone can see them. Spectator, anybody else. Now, that is not the law, but that's what they said. So we had to go to the Supreme Court. And when you go to the Supreme Court, they get about 8,000 requests. They take about 70 cases. Most of the time, what you get is cert denied. It, it, it means they're not saying they agree or disagree with the case. They're just not taking it. And that's all they say. And so we were waiting on the Coach Kennedy case. And that's certainly what you, what you don't want to hear when you've lost at the court below. And we got a cert denied, and we went, oh, no. And then somebody said, wait, there's a statement attached by the four conservative justices, and it only takes four to take a case. And in that statement, they said, you know, this is only cert denied for now. Go back down. There's a fact we want established at the trial court that's very favorable to us, and then come back. And they said, secondly, we find the Ninth Circuit's opinion below very troubling. We can't even believe that they mean what they really said. And then they said, third, and this is what sent shockwaves through the legal community. They said, by the way, we noticed that the claim that reached us first in this case was a free speech claim, not the free exercise claim. They said, maybe that's because of this Smith decision that has caused so much damage to religious freedom in the last three decades. And they said, but we haven't been asked to review that decision yet. So, we literally are on the cusp of the possibility of destroying the biggest hindrance to the free exercise of religion that we've ever had in this country and opening up free exercise in ways that none of us have experienced. And they have invited us to come back and to do so. That's incredible. 
<laughs> and then the other clause is called the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. I think most of us know what the Congress was, I mean, what our, our founders were trying to do. We don't want there to be a national church that all of us have to support. And that's what it was about. No national church, no coercion of people to support such a national church. But it got twisted in a case back in the 1970s, a case aptly called the Lemon Case. Um, in this case, all these new concepts were thrown in, like separation of church and state, things that aren't in the Constitution, things like uh, uh, offended observers. If somebody walks by and they feel offended by some religious symbol, then that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. Well, they totally contorted the Constitution into something it never was. And really, they made the Establishment Clause, they made the, that made the government hostile to religion because anywhere that religion was around government, they had to get rid of it. So you, that's why you see all these attacks on nativity scenes, on Ten Commandments monuments, on veterans memorials with crosses or stars of David. And so we had a case uh, this term, the Bladensburg Cross. This is a memorial that was put up almost 100 years ago by mothers who lost their sons in World War I. And uh, the American Legion, it was on their land. And, but eventually, this is right outside of D.C., they built roads around it. And the government took over the land to take care of the roads. But they didn't want to disturb the memorial. But then years later, the American humanists come along and say, hey, you can't have this cross on government land. You have to tear it down. Well, we won at the district court. At the Court of Appeals, we had one of the three judges say, why don't we just cut the arms off the cross? Because that way we won't have to tear it down and nobody will be offended. So this is the mindset we were dealing with. They ruled two to one, unconstitutional after 100 years. So we went to the Supreme Court and we said, we realized, number one, that if they uphold that decision, two miles away from Bladensburg is Arlington National Cemetery. They're going to have to go in there and tear down the large freestanding crosses. We said, we don't think there's any way the Supreme Court wants to do that. So rather than go for a bunt single win at the Supreme Court, you just protect this memorial. We felt it was time to say, lemon needs to go. That's what's causing all these attacks against religious freedom. It's not what the founders wanted. It's not what our Constitution says. It's making the government hostile to religion. And lemon is bad law, and it needs to go. And that's the grand slam, right, we went for. Well, the Supreme Court came back with their decision. Uh, we argued it in February. I was sitting in the court three weeks ago when they handed it down, and I knew immediately uh, one of three things could happen. Either it could say, we're upholding this decision, and a religious cleansing would begin that we couldn't even imagine. Every, I mean, they'd go into Arlington and take down the crosses. They've got to go into every community of every state of the country and take down the religious symbols. I mean, we couldn't even imagine where that would go. That's option one. Option two is they say, we're upholding this memorial, but we're not going any further to talk about other things. Or number three is they could say, we're upholding this memorial and lemon is gone. You know, that you know, that fruit is squeezed until it's dry and we're <laughs> lighting it on fire. Well, they ruled in our favor that seven to two, don't touch the memorial. And then six different justices attacked Lemon, said it was garbage, and said they're not applying it in this case. And in fact, it's really inconceivable any other case that they'll ever apply a Lemon again. So I really believe Lemon is now dead. And and this, this major weapon that they've used for 50 years to attack religion in public is over. Now, if that's true, think of what that'll mean for the gospel. Instead of everybody tensing up when religion occurs in public, everybody will go, religion in public's fine. Are you being coerced? Is this a national church? No. Welcome to America, where there are religious symbols and monuments all over the country, where prayer opens our meetings as they do our Congress. We're not ashamed of religion. We like religion. 
And religious freedom and expression is fine across our country. Think of that will mean for the receptiveness of the gospel. It's literally a change of culture. And I think this is happening because for the first time since the 1920s, we have five justices who think their job is to figure out what the original meaning of the statute or the Constitution is. So what this is doing with religious freedom is it's taking us back to our first principles. And this is literally just the beginning. I mean, this is just the first case. Look at what's coming next. Um, it's, it's really incredible when you look at the possibilities that are ahead of us. But I want to, before I get to that, I want to point out something very important. Why is this happening? It's happening because we're just brilliant lawyers. No. It's happening because God is moving his hand. And I just want to show you a couple of quick, quick examples. If you look, you could see his hand. A lot of people don't look. But uh, let me show you some. I don't know how many of you saw this, but there was a movie that came out called They Shall Not Grow Old. And I'm going to show you the trailer of this. It's only a minute and a half. And then I'll explain uh, why this is important. I was 16 years old, and my father allowed me to go. I was just turned 17 at the time. I was 16. I was 15 years. When they came to us, they were frightened children and had to be made into soldiers. Boys, here it comes. We're in the pictures. <laughs> I gave every part of my youth to do a job. There was a job to be done, and you just got on and did it. One, 14 million dead. One of the most brutal wars we've ever had. All of a sudden, a documentary comes out on this that brings in color to life to sound in, a, in the most powerful way we've ever seen it, okay? Three weeks, this comes out three weeks before our argument at the Supreme Court where we're arguing about a cross that was put up 100 years ago to recognize 49 men's names on that monument who died in World War I. Now, people were like, man, Peter Jackson, he's like a famous director. He did The Hobbit and, you know, The Lord of the Rings and all I can't believe you got him to release this right before your oral argument, <laughs> right? You know, obviously, I didn't get him to release this. God got him to release this just weeks before the oral argument. 
and I'm, I'm having lunch with uh, our lead attorney who was about to argue the case, and he said, you know that 30 years ago we made this same argument to get rid of Lemon, um, that it wasn't constitutional, and uh, I said, yeah, and he said, did you know that the Justice Department agreed with us? I said, yes. He said, did you know who wrote the brief for the Justice Department that agreed with us? And by the way, we're going into the Supreme Court where we feel like we have four votes to get rid of Lemon, but the Chief Justice was the question, Chief Justice Roberts. He said, do you know who wrote that brief in the Justice Department that said we need to get rid of Lemon? I said, no. He said, John Roberts. Thirty years before we got to this case, God was already working on the case. Three weeks before the case, he was still working on the case. This is God's hand that's moving, and I just want to be on his train because I can see what's happening in the country, and it's something I never thought possible with regard to religious freedom. So I'll just say that we're, we're literally just the beginning of this. So, um, you know, the opportunity is right in front of us. God's laid it right in front of us. And the only question is, are we going to be faithful and take advantage of what he's laid right in front of us? Um, and you might, you know, some people say, well, what can I do? You know, I'm, you know, I'm not a lawyer, thank goodness. Uh, you know, I'm, but what can I do? And I said, well, number one, you can pray. Because the spiritual warfare that goes on in these cases is tremendous. And pray for our staff. Pray for our families. I can't tell you the kind of stuff that happens, but this is a prayer battle. This is ultimately a spiritual battle. And so you can be in prayer. Number two, you can educate other people. It doesn't do us any good if we have freedoms if people don't know they have them. If we're winning ground and people don't know we're winning ground. People need to be bold because they see what God is doing and the freedoms they have. And so you can be sort of the Paul Revere. And so the easiest way to do that, make sure we have a table out back. Sign, if you're, I bet a lot of people here get our email every two weeks, but if you're not, get it, because then you'll see it and you can pray. You'll see stuff that you can share. And as we sort of unite the body of Christ, I think it'll get more and more powerful what's going on. Uh, but the third thing I would say is to stand. Um, you know, if what I think is about to happen, if we are faithful, and, and I think we're at the beginning of maybe 10 years of starting to see case after case after case where we are going to expand religious freedom and have more than we've ever had in our lifetime in this country. It's not going to do any good if nobody's willing to walk into those open areas of religious freedom and actually do something. I mean, you know, God, if God is expanding the areas for, right when the hostility is coming everywhere, he's expanding the areas for freedom, but we're not willing to walk and speak the truth then God help us, right? I mean, this is a tremendous opportunity that the Lord's giving us. And so it, I've never seen a more exciting time. I just, uh, what I would say to you is, let's go make history together and let's change this country in a way that'll be an incredible blessing for our children and our grandchildren. I just uh, thank you for the privilege of speaking with you tonight and God bless you. Praise the Lord. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. I couldn't help but think as Kelly was speaking this evening about a verse that the Lord shared with us. Uh, you all will recall this in John 16, 7 when he said, but very truly I tell you, it is good that I am going away. Unless I go away, who will not come? The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Advocate, the Counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. I addressed Kelly early as the Counselor. I said, Counselor, we're so glad to have you here this evening, but you know who I'm even gladder to have here this evening? The Counselor, the Comforter, the Advocate, and surely he has been at work in Kelly's ministry. Well, just a couple of announcements tonight. I want to make sure you're aware. Yes, go by and see Kelly. Sign up for their newsletter. Obviously, Marty and Jennifer Getz have a lot of music. If he has blessed you already this evening, if you're looking forward to the blessing of tomorrow, I hope you'll go by and tell them that. 
thank them for the Lord's blessing through his music and his ministry this evening, and then look at the materials they have. We have a number of tables of ministries who are affiliated with Lamb and Lion. So just for example, a couple that I'll highlight tonight are the folks at I Am A Watchman. Go see Joe and ask about the rapture kit. He'd be glad to tell you all about it. Go see the folks just a couple tables away at Watchman Fellowship, James Walker's newest book, What the Koran Really Teaches About Jesus. And some of you will remember that, having been on Christ in Prophecy just recently. Well, here's the plan for tomorrow. The doors will open at 7.30, the registration tables, and there will be many more people if the number of name tags not already claimed tonight are any indication. So we encourage you to come. We will have breakfast for you here. There will be great food provided, again, free of charge, just our gift to you as participants in this conference. So we we'll hope you'll come and take part in that. I would remind you, make sure that you bring your name tag because it is your admittance, not only to this hall, but to the breakfast as well. About 8.40, we will begin some special videos. I hope that you're milling about in this arena because you'll be able to see them and hear some testimonies of those who have been on some of our pilgrimages. Tomorrow, for those of you who have already asked or are interested, if you have been on a pilgrimage, we will have a gathering. I will announce the time and place tomorrow so we can have a little mini reunion and actually take a photo. We do that every year. It's become a tradition. At about 8.50, Marty Getz will kick back off to opening our day in worship, and I know that that will be a blessing to all of you. And then we'll start off with a full day, including Mike Riddell, Mike Gendron, Ron Rhodes, Eric Barger, and of course, David Reagan. So that's the plan for tomorrow. And as we close this evening, I want to close by using a passage of scripture. I have a question, I take it? Okay. We will pray for both of them, yes, ma'am, as I close out, and y'all will join me here in just a moment. But I want to read to you from Psalm 121. This is a passage that we use while in Israel and especially as we're traversing uh, to get to Israel. And so join with me prayerfully as I read from Psalm 121. It is titled, The Lord, the Keeper of Israel. And this is indeed a psalm of ascent going up to Jerusalem. I will lift my, up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord, Yahweh, is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. And so tonight, as we close what has been a wonderful, blessed evening, we will lift up our voices together as we unite our hearts and thank the Lord for his blessing thus far, praise him for his goodness, and thank him for the sleep which we will enjoy to come back refreshed tomorrow and eager for another full day of blessing. Please join me. Father God, what a great privilege it is to gather not just with two or three, but with hundreds who are determined to contend earnestly for the faith, those who are already looking forward to soon coming of our blessed hope, your son, Jesus Christ. And whether gathered here or watching from afar, we are united in our hearts this evening. We do raise up Kelly and the ministry that he is contending earnestly for faith here in this land, for our own religious liberties. We lift up those represented by our three friends, the missionaries from all around the world who've come here to testify of being partnered with Lamb and Lion. Lord, I pray your special blessing on all who have gathered this evening, that they will be protected in their going out tonight and their coming in tomorrow, and that while we rest, that you who do not sleep or slumber 
will watch over, guard, guide, and protect us, and that tomorrow we will gather again, if you stay your coming through this night, once more, to sing praises, to raise hands of praise, to hear a word from your holy scriptures. Lord, it is in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we raise this prayer together. And all people said, Amen. Godspeed. <laughs>